everyone. Um, I think my talk leads on quite nicely from a lot of the things that Julian was saying in his welcome talk. Um, and I'm going to um, excuse the dry rigidity of my performance delivery. I'm going to read and to click. And I hope that's okay with everyone. And uh, I may deviate slightly, but probably not. So here we go. Um, in recent years, musicians and musicologists have directed increasing attention towards issues of materiality in music. Much of this attention has focused on material relationships between music, performing bodies, and objects. Notions of sonic materialism or the materiality of sound itself have also received considerable attention. Um, Samuel Wilson's recent book, New Music and the Crises of Materiality, um, frames musical materiality as something problematic and in constant flux, something that requires working through. Uh, Wilson uses philosophy, cultural theory, and musicology to explore how new music allows us to register the changing conditions of materiality in late modernity and considers ways in which to practice materiality differently through music. It's the materiality of musical materials that I hope to explore during this talk, namely whether notions derived from materialist thinking can offer alternative perspectives on tonal musical materials in the 21st century, century um, specifically those present in the music of Lawrence Crane. Um, various conditions and conceptions of materiality emanate from the different layers of Lawrence's music and practice. Whether this is the bodily uh, experience, um, Lawrence's own compositional process, there it is, <laughs> his relationship with notation, uh, or the listener's perception of his music. So um, as a jumping off point, I'd like to focus in on Lawrence's harmonic materials within the context of his own compositional thinking. So when discussing his own practice, Lawrence has often used visual and haptic metaphors to conceptualize aspects of his music and compositional process. So here's a quote from an interview many of you will have read. So um, I'll read it out for you. Um, my materials have their basis in tonality, but for various reasons, historical, aesthetic, and personal, I am not interested in deploying these materials using traditional rhetoric. Therefore, I end up treating them like found objects and arranging and positioning them in different contexts from what their possible historical resonance might suggest. I use repetition a lot, so you get something like a standard cadential formula or a sequence of ordinary triads, and by subjecting them to some sort of process of repetition, or into weaving them with something else, you get to look at this object in something of a new light. I invent these objects, they're not quotes, and they seem initially to be quite familiar, ordinary or anonymous. I want the objects that I use to sound old and new at the same time. So musicians have long drawn on the conventionally material for inspiration, be it nature or visual art, for example. Um, and similarly, visual artists have long drawn on sound and music. So Lawrence himself gave a tremendous talk at the University of Southampton in 2017, titled, Can Music Aspire to the Condition of Painting? And this question is a paraphrased quotation from the 19th century English essayist and critic, Walter Horatio Pater, and there he is, who wrote that all art constantly aspires to the condition of music. As a discussion-led session, trying to articulate my own thoughts on the topic made one thing clear, attempting to position the materiality of music in relation to solid objects is challenging. So music is ephemeral and has historically been considered abstract and immaterial, but contemporary materialisms open up a plurality of frameworks through which to conceptualize music. As a temporal and spatial experience, there's a connection between everyday matter and the less tangible sonic materials of music. It might not be a solid object, but it seems to be a thing. So if we briefly sidestep the problematic dualism of materiality and immateriality in music, and instead consider Lawrence's musical materials as things, then a good place to start is with the American cultural theorist, Bill Brown, uh, and his thing theory. So in its broadest terms, Thing theory is concerned with the subject-object or human-non-human -human relationship, considering the ways in which inanimate objects shape and transform the world around them. The beginnings of thing theory can be traced to Heidegger's proposition that an object becomes a thing 
once it has ceased to serve its function. So here the distinction between a thing and an everyday object can be made when a thing is approached outside the confines of its pragmatic capacities. So an object can thus be thought of as a conceptual construct determined by the practical interests of its user, while a thing is a unique set of properties through which an entity presents itself. So Bill Brown considers thingness as what exceeds things mere materialization as objects or their mere utilization as objects, their force as a sensuous presence or as a metaphysical presence, the magic by which objects become values, fetishes, idols, and totems. Thingness can therefore be appreciated when an interruption in the circuit of our everyday interaction with objects occurs. When the function is removed, one begins to notice what is excessive in the object, the qualities and material nature of a thing that would have previously been overlooked. The term thing is simultaneously general and specific, referring to the singular and known, as well as the enigmatic and unknown. It embraces liminality and rises to the surface when no other word will suffice. This object thing dialectic is perhaps most palpable within the visual arts. So take the ready-made, for example, which repositions an ordinary object outside of its useful significance, asking the viewer to consider the object's properties and meanings that exist beyond pragmatics and purpose. Arguably, Marcel Duchamp's then controversial ready-mades offer an exploration of thingness in its essence, a contemplation of material culture through the act of intentional obsolescence. So Brown cites the work of American sculptor Klaus Oldenburg in relation to thingness, whose large public art installations display oversized replicas of everyday objects, such as a lipstick, clothespin, cake, or binoculars. So in considering Oldenburg's typewriter eraser, one is not only confronted by the magnification of an obsolete object's physical presence, but the underlying proposition that inanimate objects possess the capacity to organize the temporality of the animate world. Uh, the Fluxus artist and composer George Brecht offers another pertinent example to the discourse between object and thing through a piece from the Water Yam collection. The piece is called Table and is itself a table, using a text score that provides only a title, date, author, and the instruction table. So much like the use of the ready-made in visual art, within this performance piece, the found object is simultaneously the material for the work and the work itself. Thus, the distance between the material and the piece exists only in the perception of the viewer. If the piece is not read as an instruction for any theatrical or performative action, then a performance of table displaces our projection of functionality onto the object, instead opening up the possibility of considering the table for its material presence or acknowledging the construct of the table as an iconic sign, i.e. A table looks like a table. Um, if we return now to Lawrence's musical materials, with all this in mind, it could be argued that at a conceptual level, there exists a set of parallels between the perception of harmonic function in music and the projection of pragmatic function onto an object. At the core of both situations sits an abstract entity, an inanimate physical form in the case of objects, or a composite of pitch sounds in the case of music onto which a socioculturally agreed role is applied. In Western European common practice tonality, the perception of diatonic function as a system of relationships between hierarchically ordered pitch combinations within a defined tonal center has evolved and been reinforced through the workings of societal convention since the 17th century. Similarly, most everyday objects exist primarily within the remit of their utilization as defined by social requirement. In this sense, the existing correspondences between common practice harmony and object objectness open up the possibility of metaphorical comparison between functional chords and pragmatic objects as they are defined within thing theory. So by eschewing obvious rhetorics conventionally associated with functional harmony and often facilitating reduced listening by regularly employing processes of repetition, it's possible to metaphorically approach the chords in Lawrence's music and their harmonic relationships for their thingness rather than their hierarchical function, appreciating 
the physicality of the tones and the way they interact at a local material level. So compare this situation to those created by the artist Rachel Whiteweed, who uses industrial materials to make casts of ordinary domestic objects and architectural spaces. So in a series such as Torsos, which casts hot water bottles in materials such as resin, plaster, wax, concrete, and rubber, the work is clearly not a found object or ready-made, but the source object remains distinctly perceptible to the viewer as a trace. So although the appreciation of the surface and material appear at the foreground, the ghost of the thing's everyday practicality lurks just beneath. beneath. It might be argued, for example, that within the way Lawrence presents a sustained dominant, dominant seventh chord, the functionality of the object remains present as a trace. However, the exactness of its role is made elusive by the formal and harmonic ambiguity of its context. Much like White Reed's torsos, Lawrence's materials are in no way found objects in any literal sense, but through their elemental relationship to triadic harmony, they exhibit a discernible impression of familiarity. The way that Lawrence's harmonic palette focuses in on the commonplace seems to resonate with Brown's notion of thingness, bringing aspects of the everyday and overlooked into the center of our consciousness. Just as White Reed's torsos can be thought of as meta-objects, a term Bill Brown uses to describe an object that investigates its own status as an object, provoking one to question their own phenomenological and societal relationship with objects, it is possible to consider the chords in Lawrence's music as metachords. <laughs> so these metachords appear explicitly as chords themselves, whilst simultaneously revealing something about the nature of chords. They direct the listener's attention to the materiality of vertical sonority with all its baggage. Whether they appear beautiful, humorous, familiar, or ordinary, Lawrence's metachords offer listeners and performers a space in which to reflect on their own relationship to the basic constructs of common practice tonality and its role as a socio-historically marked syntax. So when Apartment House tweeted that Lawrence Crane is our Donald Judd, I think they're onto something. Seemingly straightforward block colors and elemental shapes are placed in such a way that it's possible to appreciate the material qualities of their surface and position in space, whilst also acknowledging the object's referential qualities, echoes, for example, of a chair, cabinet, table, window, or staircase. So although looking at Lawrence's musical materials through the lens of thing theory allows us to explore the complex relationship between the past and the present when approaching aspects of music like harmony, Thing theory also draws attention to problems inherent to binary models of materiality. So approaching Lawrence's musical materials through the dualism of subject and object, <laughs> human and non-human, uh, neglects the agency that musical material might have over the composer. So in his recent book, Wilson describes the new materialist thinker, Jane Bennett's concept of vital materialism. Um, in relation to various aspects of new music. For Bennett, material is not only something passive, which is made active by an external agent. Instead, material itself possesses a vital activating force, influencing its surroundings in reciprocal networks beyond the duality of active subject and passive object. Bennett's conception of thing power highlights the strange ability for ordinary man-made items to exceed their status as objects and to manifest traces of independence or aliveness constituting the outside of our experience. So throughout the processes of composing, performing, and listening, we are affected by and negotiate the active cultural and bodily forces that emerge from musical materials. When summarizing Adorno in relation to new music, um, in relation to new materialism, so Bennett's branch of uh, materialism, Wilson states that the subject is an active agent in responding to the needs of the material and its relation to the social and aesthetic circumstances of the present. In other words, agency is not only enacted by the composer, but by the material as well. So this sideways distribution of agency between composer and material is also echoed in the power that previous subjective compos compositional decisions hold for the composer 
in the present. So this reciprocal web of relationships between composer, musical material, and past compositional choices feels particularly salient in the context of Lawrence's music, where recycling and reframing material from previous pieces forms an integral aspect of his practice. Chords not only feel familiar because they might resemble those from a prog rock album or a 19th century piano sonata, they're also familiar because they could well have been lifted from one of his own pieces. <laughs> Although Lawrence's materials may at first feel carefully crafted and controlled through a conventionally top-down subject-object material hierarchy, there also seems to be a sensitivity or receptivity to the material as an active entity within the compositional process. A relationship that welcomes the unexpected and responds to the contemporary needs that the material presents. Consider cobbled section after cobbled section, which plus minus will perform later this evening. The first section, titled cobbled section, seems to deal with the juxtaposition of three disparate types of material, all of which make reference to tropes from Western European classical music. At face value, the piece investigates what happens when you experience these materials in various orders, durations, and combinations. It kind of feels like a formal knot unraveling. From my perspective as a listener, cobbled section presents a complex dialogue between composer, material, and history. A brief digression. Donald Judd once described Klaus Oldenburg's sculptures as grossly anthropomorphized due to their being teasingly mammary, ocular, phallic, facial, and scrotal. But their blatancy, as Judd continued, seemed to ridicule anthropomorphism as such. Instead, drawing the viewer's attention to the discrepancy between objective presence and material presence. Oldenburg sculptures may seem brash, blatant, melodramatic, and sentimental, but they draw our focus to the investment society has placed in these objects, historically or in the present. In a similar sense, cobbled section questions our cultural investment in the bombast of a tutti perfect cadence, or perhaps even satirizes the notion of the whole tone scale as the decline of functional harmony in the late 19th century. So like Oldenburg sculptures, the thing power of cobble section asks us how we feel about the rhetoric of the past, about the orchestra and obsolescence, about concert music and concert halls. The material as an active entity steeped in historical referentiality projects the possibility of producing effects and provoking difference for listeners. By mediating the, process, the material through his compositional process, Lawrence is engaged with the thing power of the material magnifying its vitality by playing on the rich commingling of authorship and expectation, historical and canonical reference, whilst still finding space for sonic materialism. So in spite of their seeming simplicity, looking at Lawrence's musical materials through a broader materialist lens offers up a space in which to appreciate the layers of complexity at play. By establishing a conceptual commonality between the constructs of functional harmony and the pragmatic use of solid objects, it's possible to map the traces of functionality in Lawrence's harmonic materials to the remnants of practicality beneath the, sur the, th the surface of a thing. The thingness of Lawrence's harmony seems to lie in the simultaneous acceptance and negation of functional harmony, stripping away its strict hierarchical structures in order to reveal the materiality of the harmonic relationships themselves. Just as a meta-object can disclose the thingness of things, Lawrence's metachords address the chordness of chords. It would be controversial to suggest that one material is more vital than another material. However, as a listener, I feel that Lawrence's music possesses a distinct resonance with Jane Bennett's concept of vital materialism. By allowing his materials to operate within repetitive, elemental, and stripped back forms without the influence of an overt subtext or narrative, Lawrence affords an opportunity for listeners to encounter the dynamic, culturally evocative thing power of the materials. While it's certainly possible to appreciate the materiality of sound itself in Lawrence's music, he also creates a space for the material's plurality to emerge, its social and historical forces, its subjective meaning, and perhaps even its sentimentality. 
By drawing our attention to the past, Lawrence's music re-energizes the way we listen to tonal materials in the present and refreshes the well-worn basics of compositional material for composers in the future. So I would like to finish up with an inspirational photo. <laughs> Thank you for listening. Any questions? <laughs> yes, Richard. <laughs> Don't do it. Yes. Yeah. Yes, well, you introduced me to thing theory by telling me about that art club. Oh, okay. But the, I sort of took it in a different direction. You but I haven't, yeah, but I haven't, haven't seen the, um, yeah. the art club. I think it would be really fascinating. And I think um, Matthew Fox, who was quite a fantastic writer, who was a thing theory person, mm. so he was a thing theory and inspiration to uh, Pascal, which is, um, um, has, has written a bit about it. Yeah. There's a, there's a, a round table with Sally and Matt and um, Matthew. Uh, I mean, I think it's, it's brilliant. And I really love the way you um, relate to the rest of the digital section, which I think mm. is such a, uh, a, a rich piece for precisely that kind of mm. analysis. So, yeah, Absolutely. Big double thumbs up to Think Theory. <laughs> think Theory's great, read it. It's actually short and a really nice read. So it's free, you can just Google it and download the PDF. And it's a lovely read. Yeah. Great. I think that's me done. It's break time now, isn't it? Perfect timing. Yeah, we have a short break now and we start again at 2012. So, great.